Hello everyone, Atheotos here and today I have for you a 486 motherboard uh, modding first video My target is this uh, Sojo 486 motherboard with assist chipset and uh, yeah, PCI slots So this is the Sojo SY4SAW2 motherboard Now you have seen me modding this motherboard before when I added uh, this little clock generator here in my previous video about uh, these devices however today I have for you four more modes that can be done on this motherboard now here I have already done all of these so mod number one is uh, adding a proper PS2 connector here for the mouse second mod of course is uh, replacing the original battery with uh, this uh, lithium coin uh, one then I replaced uh, all the caps with uh, high quality electrolytic ones and finally probably the most interesting mode is uh, here in the voltage regulator where now more or less I can set the CPU voltage at any value I want you see typically 86 motherboards are very limited here and uh, usually give you at best uh, three options so in total including my custom clock generator this motherboard has uh, five modes and yeah, here I have full control over both uh, the bus clock and the CPU voltage. So first of all, let's start with the mode for adding the PS2 port here. And yeah, this is uh, how the board was uh, before modding. And in this case, it's uh, quite straightforward. Yeah, it's quite clear that there was a prediction for this connector, but in the end, they just used the pin header here. So yeah, in the end it's uh, just as simple as uh, just removing the pin header and then soldering just the right connector here. Yeah, it just happened I had already a few of these available. So yeah, soldering this was uh, quite easy. However, after soldering I tried to put my mouse here and test it and uh, there was a problem. You see, as soon as I loaded the mouse driver, the PC froze and the main problem was a missing jumper down here, this uh, GP4. Now if we have a look at the manual of the motherboard, it is stated for this uh, jumper that if you want the PS2 mouse function, you have to have this uh, closed and the default is open. And yeah, of course, uh, this is all about the RQ12. And that is something that is uh, classically needed for the PS2 mouse. So all this makes sense. Now, additionally to that, I had already modded my BIOS and uh, added here uh, this uh, PS2 mouse support. I'm not 100% sure if this is needed, but uh, yeah, it's probably a good idea to do so. Of course, uh, if you want to know how to do this mode, you can check my previous video on this topic. So yeah, after all that, the mouse worked uh, just perfectly. Then uh, next mode was replacing this battery here. Yeah, okay, it's quite well known that this battery is quite often leak and can do a lot of damage to the motherboard. Now in my case I was uh, quite lucky here as after removing the battery the damage was actually quite minimal and also we can see here that there is again a prediction for a proper lithium battery socket so similarly to the PS2 connector I can just put uh, the socket here and uh, yeah it is a perfect match quite straightforward again however every time we are talking about a mod like that we need to be a bit uh, more careful you see the battery we removed is rechargeable and uh, the new one is not. That means that uh, the motherboard typically tries to charge the battery and we have to remove this ability. So this is uh, the circuit uh, below the battery and I checked a bit down here to see what uh, is doing what. And you want always to start checking from uh, some diodes that might be in this area. You can also probably check uh, these jumpers here that are for external battery and for uh, clear CMOS or normal operation. So normal operation is these two and the external battery was here. So let's see. The positive terminal of the battery comes here and here. This diode connects through this wire to this resistor and this resistor goes to the external battery. These two diodes connect together. So this part of the circuit is just uh, to have the ability to either use this battery or the external one. And uh, yeah, here you have just a combination with two diodes. Now this node uh, actually goes here to the normal CMOS operation. And uh, this again makes sense. So none of all this has to do with uh, charging. 
but then we have this uh, resistor that actually connects to this diode and the other side of the diode connects to this via that goes directly to 5 volt. So it looks like that for charging we have uh, just a resistor and a diode in series directly powered from the 5 volt uh, rail. So in order to cancel the charging you can remove either the diode or the resistor and uh, yeah in my case I removed both. Another point to note that uh, it's not mandatory but uh, it is one of the things that always bothers me that these diodes are just uh, normal silicon diodes that typically have a relatively large voltage drop and you see the previous rechargeable battery had a nominal voltage of 3.6 but uh, this lithium battery is lower at uh, 3 volts so yeah with the V drop here you drop uh, below 2.5 volt this is still okay but yeah as I said it's something that uh, really bothers me so yeah in the end I removed all these three and uh, put here a Schottky diode. These diodes have a very low voltage drop. The only drawback is that uh, there is a little bit of leakage current, but this is also not a significant problem here. So let's have a look here. The battery is at uh, 3 volt uh, 69, and the output of the diode is 3 volt uh, 18 17. So that means that uh, the diode only produces a 50 millivolt uh, voltage drop. With a normal diode this would be 10 times more, but again uh, this additional step of the Schottky diode I don't think it's uh, mandatory. Then next mode was replacing all the capacitors here, everywhere on this board. The motherboard had some uh, small electrolytic uh, capacitors at 220 microfarads, and also some even uh, smaller Tadalum ones. Now normally on an old board like that, that does not have any switching regulators and the only regulator is a linear one. Changing the capacitors is not that critical. However, uh, yeah, especially the Stadalum ones, uh, I really hate them. I have seen them many times sorting out. And this is actually quite strange because in some motherboards uh, everything goes well forever. And some others, uh, one capacitor goes short after the other. So in general, if your board uh, works, you are probably okay. But if you got one of these sorted, it's a good idea to replace them all. Now I think it's a good idea to have a little bit of uh, theoretical discussion about electrolytic capacitors. And yeah, aside from the classic uh, traditional electrolytic ones that we all know, like uh, the little black ones that uh, this motherboard has, there are also solid polymer capacitors. The difference is on the electrolyte that is used that mainly affects the life expectancy of uh, these ones. So regarding that, if we were to compare a polymer capacitor with a traditional aluminum one, that uh, both are rated for uh, 2000 hours of operation, we can see that as the temperature drops, the polymer capacitors are way more durable, as high as uh, 2 million hours. So under normal operating conditions and reasonable temperatures here, the polymer capacitor will always outlast the normal ones. However, there are a few more things to consider. If you have to deal with uh, high voltages, the traditional uh, electrolytic capacitors are the only option. If you care about leakage, if it is something like a node application, again, the traditional ones are better. However, in the end, uh, regarding decoupling for any low voltage power supply, the polymer capacitors are always the best option. And that is mainly because this capacitor has uh, lower ESR and TSL, and also can handle higher ripple currents. Especially for switching power supplies, this is a very nice thing to have. Now, one additional thing to note about different types of aluminum electrolytic capacitors is that, uh, okay, there is also an additional category, the aluminum hybrid polymer capacitor, that is something between the electrolytic and the polymer. And uh, also, you see even the regular electrolytic capacitors could have a look like that. So if you see any of these capacitors in a motherboard or circuit, you never know the actual type of the capacitor. However, depending the brand, it looks like there is a color coding here. With the exception of Rath Electronic that uh, marks all uh, their capacitors with red, the other manufacturers, Panasonic and uh, Kemet, and others uh, mark the regular electrolytic capacitors with black, and the polymer ones have uh, various colors like red, uh, blue, purple, and so on. 
aluminum hybrid, uh, I don't know, most of them look uh, like black. So in the end, you never really know unless you check the code here and you manage to find the exact model. But most of the cases, if you see something black, it's a hybrid or a normal one, while other colors and uh, yeah, red is a solid polymer one. So solid polymer capacitors are also the ones I used here. And uh, let's have a quick test with this uh, simple capacitor tester. First, let's check uh, this Stadalum one. Yeah, this is a uh, 4.7 microfarad with 1.6 ohm in series resistance. Let's see the electrolytic one. Around 200 microfarads, 0 0.7 ohm. And finally, the aluminum polymer. And that is around uh, 640 microfarads and uh, 0 0.18 ohms. Now I have seen uh, polymer capacitors performing way better here. But again, this is a significant improvement over the previous electrolytic capacitors. Also keep in mind that uh, this tester here is not actually that accurate with the ESR measurement. And in the end, there is also an ESL, in-series inductance. Another way to see this is that uh, the in-series resistance changes over frequency. And on higher frequencies, uh, things are getting worse. However, these polymer capacitors are also better there. In other words, uh, this is more of a capacitor than the other ones, even at uh, high frequencies. Now, the question is, uh, can we replace all capacitors here uh, blindly and just put larger ones. Well, in general, uh, as long as uh, the capacitor is connecting to the power supply rails, you are okay. But uh, you have to be very careful not replacing a capacitor that uh, connects somewhere else. And uh, this was uh, this capacitor here next to the PLL. So here I have the datasheet of the PLL chip that was originally on the motherboard. And this capacitor connects here to the LF1 pin. And uh, yeah, if we see here the description, uh, this is actually part of the PLL loop. And it is recommended by the manufacturer to put an 1 microfarad capacitor here. The motherboard uh, had an 1 microfarad uh, Tadalum capacitor. And of course this is one of the capacitors that uh, you should never replace with something bigger. So in the end I removed the Tadalum one because I hate them. And yeah, what I have here is a one microfarad uh, ceramic. Other than that, uh, okay, there are the classic stuff. Here next to the AT connector, you typically have four capacitors. One at uh, 12 volt, one at uh, minus 12 volt, one at 5 volt, and uh, one at uh, minus 5 volt. The rest ones uh, are all uh, connected to the 5 volt rail or the V-core rail. So of course I replace them all. Now all this, of course, it's an overkill, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know why, but I didn't stop there. So here we have the pinout of a typical 486 uh, CPU. Or another way to see this is as the pinout of the socket 3. And uh, yeah, do you see what I see here? Okay, of course you have your uh, signal uh, pins with white. You have your grounds with blue and uh, the power supply with red. And uh, there are something like, uh, I don't know, 20-23 red uh, pins. And all of them, very conveniently, have next to them a ground pin. Here, 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 everywhere. So yeah, I don't know why, but uh, in the end I couldn't resist. And I just soldered ceramic capacitors directly into all of these pins on the bottom of the motherboard. These small 0603 ceramic capacitors have the lowest possible ESR and TSL and combined with a not uh, that small capacitance of uh, 10 microfaradids. These actually give us uh, the perfect uh, decoupling here. Now all this is an overkill and it's not really needed, because in the end we don't even have a switching regulator here. However, in theory it should help a little bit more. Yeah, I did the same thing here and uh, I added a few of these under every capacitor that connects to the 5 volt rail. As for the capacitors I used uh, are uh, these ones, and uh, these are the only ones uh, with uh, 0603 packets that also have this uh, high capacitance and the uh, X7R dielectric. So that's all with uh, recapping. And you might ask, uh, okay, you did all that, uh, was there any difference? And uh, yeah, in the end, maybe I didn't notice something significant. 
However, it's nice to know that I just have here the best of the best in terms of uh, stability and uh, capacitors. And yeah, I don't know. I really like the looks of this. I mean, in the end, uh, okay, look at this. The PS2 port, the battery, the capacitors. All this definitely does not look uh, like a 486 motherboard. So now time to talk about the final and most uh, exciting mode here. The mode on the voltage regulator of the CPU. And uh, let's go directly and have a look at the datasheet. This is a linear low drop uh, voltage regulator from Sharp. This is a PQ30RV21. And I have to say I really love uh, this chip and uh, all uh, similar chips from Sharp. My only complaint is that uh, most of these models are actually discontinued. So you might have a hard time replacing this if any blows up. However, the specs are so nice that I'm still loving them. So this specific one, 2 amps of output with uh, plus minus 2% accuracy and a maximum uh, voltage drop of uh, half a volt at the maximum load of 2 amps. And only 4 pins, one for ground, one for voltage in, one for voltage out and one to adjust the voltage of the output. Quite straightforward uh, design also with all the typical protections, including overheating protection. So this is the typical circuit. The adjust pin, it's typically connected through a voltage divider to the output, here with uh, R1 and R2. And uh, this pin, yeah, the, the adjust pin, uh, tries to get a V reference of 125 volts. So the output voltage is just given by this formula here. That is the V reference times 1 plus R2 divided by R1. This is of course the same type of circuit that the motherboard has. With the only difference of course that there are some jabbers here to select between different uh, resistor values. Another thing I like about uh, this chip is that, yeah, okay, it might be stated that the maximum current is 2 amps, but as this is a linear regulator, the regulator is stressed uh, less when the difference between input voltage and output voltage is smaller. So here we can see that the actual overcurrent protection allows for higher currents when here the output voltage is closer to the input voltage and if it is 70%, 70 to 100%, you can even draw 3 amps without a problem. Now in this application, it's nearly impossible to draw more than 1.5 amps. So this uh, voltage regulator here is uh, more than enough, no matter how much overclock or anything I do here. Another point to note is that, uh, of course, it's not only the maximum current that uh, we care about, but also the power dissipation of the device. And uh, this is actually given by the current multiplied by the voltage drop across the device, where the voltage drop across the device is the input voltage minus the output voltage. Again, on our application, this voltage drop might be maximum 1.5 volt, and if we multiply this, I don't know, by 2 amps, it's uh, 3 watt. So we want something like a 3 watt uh, dissipation. And even without a heatsink, this device can do 1.5. Here we have uh, this uh, little heatsink. Yeah, it's not the best, but I think that for the 3 watts we need here, uh, this is more than enough. Then, okay, just to be in the safe side, I remove this and place some uh, more thermal compound here and also some uh, thermal compound between the heatsink and the motherboard. So now the motherboard also helps a bit with uh, the heat dissipation. Now, as it is typical of uh, most 486 motherboards, this one also has uh, three jumpers here, and uh, only one should be connected each time. And uh, this allows you to select something between uh, 3.4, 3.6 and 4 volts. And this, uh, yeah, this actually made me wonder if you have three jumpers, why only three settings and uh, not uh, have actually all the combinations that will give you two to the power of three or eight different settings. So this is what I wanted uh, my mode to do. For sure, I can come in here and uh, put a variable resistor and have any possible generated voltage. But uh, yeah, first of all, I like jumpers because they give you exact same conditions when you try to test different processors. And also, while this is heavily modded, it doesn't look uh, that much different. So let's see what were the actual resistors here and uh, how I modified them to get uh, this result. 
as we said uh, with the original settings uh, you had these uh, three options for the voltage of the CPU and this was given by these uh, three resistors where okay one every time was connected now aside uh, from the fact that you only have uh, three options uh, this configuration here is also quite dangerous because uh, if uh, by mistake you start your system without any jumper here the output will be 5 volt or okay close to 5 volt and this might be an overkill for your uh, processor so yeah after the mode I now have 8 options for the voltage of the CPU and I selected them a bit on the high side because uh, my focus is always overclocking so the minimum option now is uh, 3.66 and the maximum 4.36 now the step is not uh, actually always the same but uh, more or less yeah with every step uh, you get something like uh, 100 millivolts uh, more what i really like about this set is that i have very fine options for all the cpus with nominal voltage 3.45 but i also have some options above 4 for the 4 volt uh, cpus now the way i pulled this off is that uh, First of all I put uh, a permanent resistor between uh, the adjust and output, this uh, 620 ohms. And then I change the three other resistors. The bottom resistor to the ground is the same. For the three other resistors I choose uh, these values with uh, let's say the 7.5 kilo ohm in the center value. And then actually you can use the same resistor uh, two times in parallel and uh, two times in series to get the two other values. So yeah, a quite comfortable mode actually. If for some reason you want another range, you can come here and, uh, I don't know, put another basic resistor here, I don't know, 580, and this will uh, send all the voltages downwards. But again, I'm interested in overclocking, so I think this is the best for me. So again, this is the final results, and uh, here are the four resistors. The top uh, right one is uh, the one to the ground and I didn't change it. And then I just changed the three others. Then OK here on the bottom side I just added uh, this uh, fixed 620 ohm resistor. The final touch of course was uh, this nice uh, blue jumpers. And uh, here if you have all of them plugged in you have the lowest value. And if you remove all of them you get the maximum one that is uh, 4.3. It is a bit high but again better than before that uh, this uh, would give you something around 5 volt that might damage the CPU so now I think it's a good idea to show you a bit how this goes in practice and uh, yeah here I have all the jumpers in so it's the lowest setting should be 3.66 volt okay I don't have a VGA card so I get this error but okay and the voltage is 3.66 now let's remove one jumper and we we'll get the set count setting that should be 3.74 and it is 3.74 this is the third setting 3.83 right on mark the fourth setting 3.92 that's exactly right and uh, yeah let's remove all and see the maximum setting here we are 4.36 so you get the idea we have now 8 settings 3 jumpers and all are exactly on the spot so yeah I'm quite happy with this result so yeah, with that, I think we can conclude this video. There's not uh, much more to do here. This Labrat survived all the modding operations and it's now stronger than ever. So of course, the next step is to try and overclock all of my 486 CPUs. And uh, this here is only part of my collection. I'm also waiting for some uh, Pedium overdrives that I want to test. But of course, all this is uh, for another video. So I hope uh, you liked uh, this one and all these modes. And of course, uh, if you don't want to miss what is coming on next, subscribe. So see you again next time.